So now let's have a different schematic look at these pathways. So on the left side of this figure, we have an illustration of the first pain pathway. So again, this begins with an A-delta fiber that uh, is going to provide input into the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. And then from there, there will be a direct projection from spinal cord to thalamus. This side of our anterolateral system is called the spinal thalamic tract because it's a direct shot between the dorsal horn of the spinal cord and the principal thalamic nuclei that then relay signals up into our somatic sensory cortex. Now, as you might imagine, things are a little bit more complex on the other side of this figure. The other side of this figure is intended to illustrate the um, second pain pathway. So here's our second pain pathway, which begins with C fibers that provide input into dorsal horn neurons that then give rise to projections that terminate in a variety of structures throughout the brainstem and even on up into the forebrain into structures such as the amygdala and the hypothalamus. Now we won't talk in depth about all of these targets but I do want to highlight uh, two in particular. The reticular formation refers to a broadly distributed set of cells in the core of the brainstem and among those cells are multiple small nuclei that are involved in very particular kinds of functions. And some of these functions are those that influence our overall level of arousal and our overall level of attention. And it's through such mechanisms, we think, that the reticular formation can receive information about pain and thereby modulate our cognitive states. There's another interesting structure in the brainstem that receives this information. It's called the periaqueductal gray. The periaqueductal gray is a structure in the midbrain that surrounds the cerebral aqueduct. We'll come back and talk more about the periaqueductal gray in a few minutes. This is a structure that's critical for the uh, top-down or the feedback modulation of pain transmission in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. Now, over here on the right side of this bifurcating input is nuclei of the thalamus that is on the medial side of that Y-shaped lamina, in particular nuclei right along the midline, and nuclei actually buried within that lamina. These nuclei give rise to cortical projections that are accessing parts of the brain that are involved in processing emotional signals, as well as signals that help build up uh, an image of our body that is especially informed by our internal state. Uh, that seems to be what's going on here in the insula. Whereas the anterior cingulate cortex is a very interesting part of the brain. Um, it participates in prefrontal cortical networks that are involved in evaluating the significance or the consequence of our actions. And we know some, from some very interesting studies that activation of the anterior cingulate cortex seems to be associated with the burden of our pain. And this can be modulated in experimental studies through hypnotic suggestion. And it's been demonstrated that the more we feel pain as an unpleasant experience, uh, the greater is the activity in this part of the cingulate gyrus. Okay, well, um, I just want to review for you again the overall organization of somatic sensory pathways and I'm going to refer you to a separate tutorial to go into more detail about the organization of the pain pathways. But I'll just remind you that for the conscious awareness of somatic sensation we have two pairs of pathway. One pair of pathways that serves the postcranial body and another pair that serves the region of the anterior cranium including the face. So for the postcranial body then we have a pathway that is concerned with somatic sensory experience in the domain of mechanosensation. And this would be the dorsal column medial lumniscal system that we discussed in a previous tutorial. Our system that conveys pain and temperature signals for the postcranial body is called the anterolateral system. And now for the anterior cranium, for the region of the face, our mechanosensory pathway runs through the principal or the chief sensory nucleus of the trigeminal complex, as we saw in a previous tutorial. But for pain and temperature signals, 
the processing runs through a different division of the trigeminal brainstem. It runs through the spinal nucleus of the trigeminal complex. So uh, at this point, I would encourage you to just hold the thought about the pain pathways, and we'll take that up in a separate tutorial. But for now, let's move on and consider some uh, topics of particular interest concerning how nociception is processed uh, and modulated uh, by both uh, local factors as well as neural factors. So let's consider the phenomenon of hyperalgesia. Hyperalgesia refers to inflammatory pain. This is a condition of enhanced sensitivity to mechanosensory stimulation that follows the onset of injury and the development of a response in the tissue that engages the immune system and other mediators of inflammation. So hyperalgesia is due to the peripheral sensitization of our nociceptors, uh, largely due to the action of paracrine mediators of inflammation. So following tissue injury, there's an immune response to that injury. And there are uh, immune cells that will uh, infiltrate the area, such as our macrophages and our mast cells and our neutrophils, and they begin releasing immune mediators that can have an impact on uh, the vasculature that supplies this region uh, and have impacts directly on the free nerve endings of our first order nociceptive axons. Many of these mediators are those that will modulate the activity of our trip channels. Uh, things like uh, ATP, uh, bradykinins, protons, histamine, prostaglandins. All of these mediators can increase the uh, currents that flow through those trip channels and thereby increase the sensitivity of those free nerve endings. Well, notice what else is happening here. The free nerve ending itself can release neuroactive peptides that then interact with these immune cells or the vasculature. So there is, in a sense, a bit of bidirectional signaling here between the inflamed tissue and the free nerve ending itself. These interactions can lead to an increase in the sensitivity of that free nerve ending to the signals that are being transduced into pain. Well, in addition to peripheral sources of modification that can lead to hyperalgesia, there can also be changes within the central nervous system itself, specifically in the dorsal horn or in the spinal trigeminal nucleus, that can lead to central sensitization. So this can contribute to the phenomenon of hyperalgesia. So there may be activity-dependent increases in the excitability of these second-order neurons following high levels of nociceptive activity. And this increase in the excitability of these second-order neurons might generalize from nociceptive inputs to the collaterals of other polymodal inputs that might respond to uh, mechanical stimulation. And this can be a problem. This can lead to a phenomenon called allodynia, which means that a normally innocuous stimulus might be perceived as being painful. And perhaps this is happening because these second order neurons now have generalized their excitable state. Now there seems to be uh, two forms of central sensitization that reflect the mechanisms of long-term potentiation. So you'll recall from our discussion of synaptic plasticity that with a coordination of activity across the synaptic connection, that connection can strengthen. There is an early form of long-term potentiation that's transcription independent. So this is what we consider to be a phenomenon that's called wind-up in the field of pain management. So this is when there's repeated activation of nociceptors and it leads to the sustained depolarization of that second order neuron. If there is an NMDA receptor dependent mechanism at play, you can imagine that sustained depolarization might be sufficient to remove magnesium block, allowing for the influx of calcium and the establishment of long-term potentiation at such synaptic connections. So we know that the postsynaptic conductances that are gated by glutamate can become uh, more effective now 
in these neurons that have undergone these sorts of wind-up uh, phenomena. And so presumably that reflects an activity-dependent plasticity at the connection between these first-order nociceptive afferents and their targets in the dorsal horn. There's also a transcription-dependent form of central sensitization that we imagine might be triggered through that influx of calcium. Uh, and that requires the mediation of transcription factors that can modify the expression of genes in the nucleus of cells there in the dorsal horn. So changes in gene expression can lead to a longer term maintenance of that hyperexcitable state. So now let's turn our attention to the central regulation of nociception and pain. And um, let's consider the phenomenon of analgesia, which refers to the absence of pain despite the presence of a nociceptive stimulus. Well, uh, as I mentioned at the onset, pain is a complex phenomenon, uh, and it's subject to all kinds of modulatory influences. For example, context is very important. Uh, the emotional context of the trauma, uh, such as stress uh, during injury, can lead to a heightened sense of the experience of pain associated with that injury. Your cognitive understanding can have a profound impact on your experience of pain. Uh, perhaps many of you have been injured during some athletic competition, and uh, perhaps you uh, were aware of the injury at the time, but you quickly re-entered the game and continued to participate, and it was only some time later that the full impact of that injury was experienced. So somehow, you had the ability to allow context to help you suppress your experience of pain. And then there are cultural differences in the experience of pain. And uh, we, we know this from studies across uh, the world that have looked at the experience of pain in, in different people groups. And we know there can be incredible variation in uh, how different cultures establish their norms for the response to pain. Uh, we don't know the explanation for most of these phenomena, but at least some of them seem to be attributable to the feedback or the descending modulation of pain transmission. And we are now gaining some insight into the circuitry that's involved. So the feedback pathways that modulate pain are depicted in this figure. And there are a number of structures that are highlighted here, and I'd like to draw your attention to a few of them. Uh, one right in the middle is called the periaqueductal gray. I mentioned this briefly. This is the gray matter that surrounds the cerebral aqueduct in the midbrain. The periaqueductal gray is really a key node in a network that allows for the feedback modulation of pain. The periaqueductal gray is receiving input from structures in the forebrain, such as the amygdala and the hypothalamus. These are structures that are involved in our emotional experience and expression. Uh, the paraaqueductal gray receives input from the somatic sensory cortex and from the insular cortex. And together, these inputs are integrated. The output of the periaqueductal gray goes to other parts of the brainstem, in particular, the reticular formation that's present in the medulla. And from this part of the reticular formation, we have inputs that uh, terminate in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. In addition to the medullary reticular formation, there are really interesting inputs that come from some of the nuclei of the brainstem that release biogenic amine neurotransmitters, such as the locus ceruleus in the raphe nucleus. The locus ceruleus releases norepinephrine in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, and the raphe nuclei release serotonin. And these neuromodulators can influence the excitability of the dorsal horn neurons. Well, uh, this figure uh, is far from complete, and we don't really understand how all of this works. But the basic principle at play here is that there are projections from the brain stem to the dorsal horn that can impact the transmission of nociceptive signals right at the very first synapse in the pain pathway. Also present in that circuitry of the dorsal horn in the region of the substantia gelatinosa are interneurons that release neuropeptides such as enkephalins.
and other kinds of endogenous opioid substances. What these neuropeptides seem to do is inhibit the activity of the nociceptive afferent as it makes synaptic contact with the dorsal horn neuron. So we can imagine that descending inputs from structures like the Raffae nucleus and the locus ceruleus and the medullary reticular formation can drive the activation of these local circuit neurons with the effect of turning off the output from that dorsal horn. And that, we think, is one way that the brain can produce an analgesic effect right at the very first synaptic junction along our nociception pathway.